I've been continuing to think about the idea that the definition of sin changes and varies depending on which tree you're eating from. So if you're eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, sin is having shortcomings. Sin is defined as the transgression of the law, which is whatever rule or standard there is to fail to meet that, then that is sin. But if you're eating from the tree of life, then sin is the consciousness of sin, the focus of it. So sin gets changed from having shortcomings to focusing on them. So I was thinking about this and how it's important to substitute the meanings of words when reading the text. So if you get to something like, Jesus saved us from our sins, what does that mean? Does that mean Jesus saved us from failing to meet a standard? Does that mean Jesus saved us from having limitations? And very much that seems to be what's promoted by religion. In fact, the whole entire word of faith idea is based on the fact that your limitations are just a something that you can work out and then you can become this completely independent individual. It's always saying, here's what you can do and then these limitations you have will disappear. And if we think of the idea of what typically is the representation of what heaven is, or utopia, or whatever you want to call it, Eden, before the fall, all these different concepts of what the perfect world is, and they're always bound up in the idea that there's no struggle. There are no limitations. Everyone just has this happy romp of no struggles, no limitations, no conflict, no lack, no need. And really, I don't understand how anybody could ever interact with other people if they really had absolutely no need of anything. And I don't know, I mean, I guess to some extent there's even the idea where like everyone just spends their entire eternity bowing and worshiping God. And that just all these representations the point is that they're so divergently different from what life is like none of them are at all what life is like and so then you get to a message that says the kingdom is here now and you are the temple and all these different messages that we have saying you are accepted you are the son you are you are in the likeness and image of God and we look and then we have this ideal and it's interesting that the word ideal and idol have the same root. So we have this idol, this false representation and we compare that to what life is like and we say, oh no, the kingdom of heaven isn't here. It's off in the distance because it this doesn't match my idol. And we constantly have this idol and we match things up against it and we say, this doesn't match my idol. And so it's kind of like when the people got to the promised land and they sent out the spies and two of them said, it's great. And the rest of them said, this doesn't match our idol. This is not the promised land because there's giants in there. And so they had a false representation of what it should be like to come into the land. And I think we tend to have a false representation of what it is to be perfect, which is why I said perfect isn't without flaw. It's having need of nothing, but that doesn't, or it's not having need of nothing. It's, it's wanting, it's because perfect love is to give wanting nothing in return. Perfect means whole and complete. And so you're whole and complete when you still have those limitations. If you cut them off, then that would be incomplete. But then we get to the idea of 
whether or not it's even really a limitation. And that's what really kind of started to strike me was the idea of misidentifying things as even being shortcomings or limitations. And this all comes from the ideal or the idol of being personally, individually without limitations and without flaws and having need of nothing on a personal and individual level. Like as though we're all supposed to be unique individuals having need of nothing. And that's really what the whole self-help industry is about too, is, is let's purge you of your limitations and let's get rid of those shortcomings you have. And really, I was thinking about this, like how much are we misidentifying limitations as limitations, whereas shortcomings, when they aren't really, they're just a difference in design. So if I were to use an illustration from your body, the hand doesn't chew, it doesn't breathe, it doesn't filter toxins from the blood. It does what it does. It, it grabs things, it holds things, it shifts things around. Um, but we wouldn't consider it to be a limitation or a shortcoming that our hand doesn't breathe or that our hand doesn't chew our food or whatever multitude of things that another body part does do but our hand does not. And we wouldn't think that our kidneys and our liver as the filtration system of the body are that it's a limitation or a shortcoming on their part that they don't see or uh, whatever other multitude of things that they don't do. They do what they were designed to do. They, they serve the purpose they were intended to serve and they're just as important as any other part. And so if we were to if you were to actually be able to to take a interview and you were to ask your left foot tell me about what a day is like tell me about what life is like tell me what the experience is like and then you were to ask your right ear the same question you'd get two completely different ideas of what a day is like what what it looks like what it feels like what it sounds like what experience there is. And so you could have the two parts, the foot and the ear saying, well, clearly this other part is not part of the same body as I am because that sounds nothing like what life is like to me. And then you could have your hand could say, oh no, I assure you the foot and the ear are part of the same one body even though your experience is different. I have the ability to follow the line and have this vantage point where I can see that both are part of the same one body. And the only thing that the foot and the ear are unified in, in agreeing upon is that the hand is out of line and that the hand is a liar and that under no circumstances should the hand be listened to because clearly they are not part of the same body. So you have the one part that does actually know the fullness of the picture. And it's saying, here's how it is. And the parts are saying, no, our experience is too vastly different from each other. Our descriptions of life is too vastly different from each other. We cannot possibly be part of the same one body. And getting back to this whole idea, so, so there's that of because of this limitation, because of what our perspective is, instead of l looking and saying, okay, well, here's the pr perspective I have from my position, and here's this position that's different from mine. And so we can put these together and get a bigger, wholer, fuller picture. But again, going back to the illustration, you wouldn't consider the fact that the ear hears but doesn't speak to be a shortcoming or a limitation of the ear. You wouldn't think that's wrong. You wouldn't think that it's less of an ear because it's not a mouth. 
Um, and yet we look at each other and we say, well, I'm capable of doing this and you're not, so that's a shortcoming on your part. That's a limitation on your part. You need to get it together and become capable of the things that, that I can do or whoever else can do. And so that would be like saying that the ear should be able to pick things up and it should be able to see and it should be able to smell and it should be able to filter the blood and it should circulate the blood throughout the, throughout the body. That the ear should be complete as a body itself and that the hand should be complete as a body itself and that the foot should be complete as a body itself rather than just being individual components that serve a purpose and do the role that they were designed to do. And we look at people as though people are, rather than members of one body, as though people are a body in whole, in total, and we should all be personally, individually independent of one another. And this is what s sabotages our ability to help one another or to ask for help is because we think, oh no, I need to be a personally independent individual without need of anyone. And then we condemn others like, oh, you're not capable of doing everything all by yourself. What's wrong with you? And so one thing that you could describe as the world, if you want to actually get a more accurate representation of what is, what is the world? Well, the world says you should be personally and independently, personally independent, having need of nothing and having need of no one and having no weaknesses, having no limitations. And so whether it's through some religious effort of like the word of faith has or whether it's self-help or whatever it is, this idea of purging all your weaknesses and purging all your limitations and becoming separate from everything else as your own unique whole having no part in anything else is completely opposite of how we were designed. So just as much as we would say that it's not a shortcoming of the hand that it doesn't hear, it shouldn't be considered a shortcoming on the part of Chuck if there's something Chuck can't do that Rob can do. And the whole point is that Rob does what Rob does and Chuck does what Chuck does. And if they work together, then that's the way that it was designed to, to be. Is that we become the strength in each other's weakness. So that's where we should be is to say, here's what my function is. And these limitations that I have are to be filled by someone else. And even just saying that, I'm sure there's a certain amount of people thinking like, like, no, you don't put that on somebody else. You take responsibility for your own self. No, but that's my point. My whole point is that we have this concept like you should not have need of others. And that's just so far off from how it's meant to be. It's, we're not meant to be independent individuals that need nothing and no one. We're meant to be interdependent, having need of each other, and being the strength in each other's weakness, and being the fulfillment of another's limitation. So even though we have different functions and different experiences and different limitations. We don't need to think of that as a shortcoming or as a sin, so to speak, or as something that is wrong with somebody. And I would think about how we have these ideals, we have these idols, we have these representations of what a person should be like as a self-sufficient individual, needing no one, having absolutely all responsibility consumed 
within the own self. And when I was growing up, there were certain attributes that of my personality and my experience that was conveyed to me like no that's not what a that's not what a young boy should be like and so this was identified as though it was a shortcoming and i grew up kind of feeling like there was something fundamentally wrong with being me like as though it was just simply wrong to be me and i never should have been born i was some kind of defect or mistake because I didn't fit someone else's concept of what that should look like. And so I've come to the understanding now that this emotional sensitivity that I've had was not something that is a defect and that it could just as well, just as easily have been conveyed to me that this emotional sensitivity is a talent or a skill or a gift that allows me to empathize with others. And if that had been taught to me that way, then I could have been taught how to use that skill properly. But instead, what I had been taught was that's not what boys are like. Boys don't cry like that. Uh, there was a certain idol that I was being matched up to. And it wasn't a representation of what my function was. So it wasn't even actually a limitation. It was a talent. It was a skill. And yet... It was taught to me as though it was a limitation because it didn't match up with a social standard. And so I spent an entire lifetime struggling with this concept that it was wrong to be me. That who I was was sick or defective simply because I felt things with an intensity that's not typical. And it just makes me think of like, how much do we misidentify strengths as weakness? How much do we misidentify a skill as a shortcoming. And that's something to think about because it's not a shortcoming that your ear does not circulate the blood throughout your body. It's not its function. It's not what it was meant to do. And so we look here and we have Romans 12 and it says for as we have many as we have many members in one body and all members have not the same office so we being many are one body in Christ and everyone members one of another even though the foot describes the experience of life so vastly different than the ear and say clearly we are not part of the same one body we are part of the same one body we're not individual bodies we're members in one body we need for each other we have different functions we have different purposes. We have different meanings that we were meant to fulfill. And that requires an interdependence between one another. 
that requires my strength filling in your weakness and your strength filling in mine. It requires us to cooperate and work together and not to say, well, since I can do this and you can't, there's something wrong with you. But rather to say, since I can do this and you can't, I need to do that for you. So in 1 Corinthians 12, we read, it says, Wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed, and that no man can say that Jesus is Lord but by the Holy Ghost. Now there are diversities of gifts but the same Spirit, and there are differences of, of administrations but the same Lord, and there are diversities of operations but it is the same God which works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge, by the same Spirit. And so we see that although there are diversities of gifts, and differences of, of administrations, and diversities of operations, it's all part of the same one body. And it is the same God which works all in all. And it is the same Spirit by which everything is working. And it doesn't matter which one of these gifts in the subsequent passage that may or may not be yours or may or may not be mine. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, the gifts of healing by the same Spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, discerning of spirits. To another, diverse kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. But these all work that one and self-same Spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. For as the body is one and has many members, and the, all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body. Whether we be Jews or Gentiles, believers or unbelievers, go with that where you will. Whether we be bond or free, we have all been made to drink into one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. And I just want to take a sidebar here for a minute. That, unfortunately, we've kind of characterized, like... This is this these are the gifts. These are just some illustrations. It could be practicing medicine could be your gift. It could be a way with words that's your gift. It could be getting people to laugh that's your gift. There's so many things that we all have as aspects of our personalities that aren't mentioned here, but that doesn't mean that they're not part of what's being referenced here. It's an illustration. It has a limitation of having to be an illustration. It's not the whole of the thing. It's not the entirety of the picture. It's just an illustration to say, although you have different gifts, although you have different abilities, you're still all part of the same one body. It's not to include these specifics or to exclude those not named. It's not to say that the ability to play guitar has nothing to do with the gifts. That just wasn't part of the illustration. So it really doesn't matter what that talent or gift or skill is. It's not discredited by not being mentioned in this list. It says, For the body is not one member, but many. Now let's look at how this matches this illustration that came earlier. If the foot shall say, Because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, Because I am not the eye, I am not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? Here we have part saying, I don't serve the same function as this other part. 
I don't have the same skills as this other part. I seem to have limitations that prevent me from being able to do the thing that that one does. So I guess we're not part of the same body. If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? But now has God set the members, every one of them in the body, as it has pleased him. And if they were all one member, if they were all the same thing, if they all had the same functionality, where were the body? Well, they'd have no need of a body. They'd be personally and individually independent, having need of no one or anything. Our distorted, perverse, satanic view of what we think utopia is. That I have no need of anyone else because I have no limitations. I'm person personally and individually completely self-sufficient, having no struggle or limitation. If they were all one member, where were the body? But now are they many members, yet but one body? And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. You see, the difference of administration, the difference of skill, the difference of ability is what causes you to have need of the other. If the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. No, much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. Hmm. Interesting that it's mentioned that those things that seem to be more limited are necessary. And those members of the body, which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor, and our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. For our comely parts have no need, but God has tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked. God has tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked. The uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. That one that you think that is kind of useless might actually be what you have the greater need of. And if we stop misidentifying a difference as a shortcoming, then we might be able to find the strength in that weakness and the weakness in that strength. Having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another, because they need each other, because they do not fulfill the same functions as each other, because the hand does not see and the eye does not feel. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it, or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are the body of, the, of Christ and members in particular. There is one body and one spirit, even as you are called in the hope in there, let me start again. <laughs> there is one body and one spirit, even as ye are called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. 